welcome and thank you for coming and um, celebrating our 10th anniversary with us. We're going to have a whole array of amazing speakers um, today that are going to take us into the future. But before we step into this future, I thought that we should take a look back and see what science has actually brought to us. Okay, we live in exceptional times, and often enough, we don't even appreciate it. So now what we're going to do is a little morning exercise. Can you all please just get up? We're going to do a little experiment to see what science has given us already today. Okay, good. Up and down, up and down. Uh, so you can sit down again if your birthday falls on an even day of a month. So if your birthday is on a 2nd, 4th, 6th, 8th, 10th, 12th, 14th, 16th, 22, 24, 26, you can sit down. Remain standing if it's 28 and 30, just for statistical reasons. Okay. So 200 years ago, child mortality was 40%. That means that uh, four out of ten children did not survive their first five years of life. And it was pretty much uh, like that um, for the 200,000 years of Homo sapiens existence on this planet. Okay, we're going to do another one. You can s sit down if you're over 35. <laughs> you understand where? <laughs> now we see the young chickens. <laughs> And we're standing. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <clears throat> but just a hundred years ago, the average life expectancy was not more than 35 years of age. I should actually have as well a seat here, I, because I would have not been long, uh, alive long enough to give this lecture. But then again, if you look around in the room, there's journal managers still standing, but um, that's about it. <laughs> I think this frontier story would not work so well in this way. Okay, so let's relax. The few remaining ones that are standing can sit down again, take a deep breath, and let's all be happy to be here in this room. So what has actually happened? Why are we all here? It's really all thanks to science. It saved our lives many times over and over again. The biggest killers in the past used to be infectious diseases. And in fact, it was really scientific discoveries in uh, biology, chemistry, public health, um, agriculture as well, um, that has made us um, live much longer. So here I want to show you some of these um, um, discoveries. I'm just going to um, put them one, uh, overlay these two graphs, and then let's start. So it all really started with very uh, basic discoveries. About 170 years ago, an Austrian doctor called uh, Ignaz Semmelweis, he discovered that simply washing, or well, he discovered that uh, childbed fever is actually a contagious disease, and then simply washing your hands can prevent it from spreading and saving lives. Shortly after, Louis Pasteur discovered the germ theory of disease, and then we learned how to combat uh, germs and bacteria with antibiotics. A hundred years ago, pneumonia and tuberculosis used to be one of the biggest killers. Today, it is pretty much tamed with antibiotics. Um, at the beginning of the 19th uh, century, Karl Landsteiner discovered uh, uh, blood groups, and with that he opened the road towards blood transfusions. Shortly after, Levinson discovered that adding citrate to blood allows its storage. And then, these two discoveries basically saved more than a billion lives. I, before I started this presentation, did not know about these two scientists. I bet you also did not know about them, but they were huge lifesavers. Then today we have vaccines that pro protect us against infectious diseases. 200 years ago, Jenna developed the first vaccine against smallpox, and thanks to this discovery, smallpox became the first human disease to be completely eradicated from planet Earth in the 1980s. That alone saved this vaccination, saved 530 million lives. And then in the 1950s, um, Salk discovered uh, or developed the, a vaccine against polio, saving another 120 million lives. And today we have lots and lots of vaccines that protect us against uh, infectious disease 
from um, tuberculosis to diphtheria, measles, huge lifesaver. And today we even have vaccines against cervical cancer. The other huge killer in the past used to be famines. But then with steam and electricity, we had the Industrial Revolution. They brought about the Industrial Revolution. And with the Industrial Revolution, we had actually enough uh, safety and security to grow our population. So at the onset of the Industrial Revolution, um, there were a billion people on this planet. And within just 130 years, we doubled to 2 billion. And then just within one lifetime, we went up to 7 billion people on this planet. And it was really two discoveries that made, this, uh, that made it possible to feed so many people within such a short time. In, um, at, in the, at, again, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was two uh, German chemists that discovered a way how to synthesize nitrogen and use it as a fertilizer. And the Haber-Bosch process saved, again, nearly three billion lives since then. Huge discovery. And then in the 1940s, Norman Borlaug developed ways of how to produce um, high-yield, disease-resistant wheat. And it's estimated that that discovery triggering the Green Revolution, saved more than 250 million to 1 billion people. I think it's quite clear that science is saving lives over and over, and there is a great news attached to that. There's more of us on this planet, and we are making scientific discoveries really at an exponential rate. Today there is 8 million scientists, you see how, how that has grown, we're commanding over a worldwide R&D budget of $2.3 trillion. So we're making with this money more discoveries, we're producing more data, and we're summarizing this, this, these discoveries in research articles. Last year, 2.4 million research articles were published. And this creates a beautiful research and innovation cycle. Research and innovation lead to um, growth, economic growth, and then governments and the industry have more money to reinvest back into our research labs. <coughs> Sounds all great, but here obviously is the bad news and why we're all here in this room. The current publishing system is severely bottlenecking this innovation cycle and prosperity cycle. So let me show, show you how. Some of you have already seen these slides, but we have as well a lot of new faces in the room. As I said, last year, 2.4 million articles were published. And still today, 80 to 90% of these articles are published behind expensive subscription paywalls. Clean energy solutions are just not widely available. Doctors who are treating us today do not have access to the latest medical studies. And even us, the researchers, we can't access all of the latest research because our universities can't afford uh, to pay the f subscription fees to all the journals, not even the richest universities. The scale of the problem is actually quite massive. Scholarly journals usually have an embargo period of at least one year, often much longer. And the calculation is quite simple. On 2.4 million articles, that sums up to 2.4 million years of delay to access last year's science if you add each article. And this is the other reason why we are here today. You know that in order to publish these 2.4 million articles, it's estimated that at least half of them go through bouncing cycles. They are bounced around from one journal to another before they do get published. It's the rejection cycle. And we all know in this room that it takes at least six months, but often much longer to get your article published. So again, summing it all up, the accumulated delay to publish valid science is another 600,000 years. And if you add it all up, the delay to access our latest science and publish our latest science is 3 million years. It's quite astonishing. And that is why we're all in the room today, because we've all experienced it firsthand. And that's why we as well started Frontiers about 10 years ago and why we have this large community of all of you that participate. Frontiers is an open science platform and um, in open science everybody can access the latest science. 
for free. In the old subscription model, you, our universities pay so that we can read the papers, whereas in the new open science model that's been already around for like 15 years or so, universities pay so that, we can, uh, that our pro papers get processed, and then everybody in the world can read for free. And in fact, it's much cheaper to publish in open science. Currently, an open access article costs on average 1,500 euros, whereas a subscription article costs somewhere in the range between four and 5,000 euros. I'm not going to go too much into this because Fred is actually going to tell us a little bit more how we think about article processing charges, how they compare to subscription articles. But let's put it this way, if universities would decide to switch to the open access model overnight, they could actually overnight save in the range of 6 to 8 billion euros to do more research. And we could also completely eliminate these inefficiencies and delays in the current publishing model. And open science works, and it works actually extremely well. So here I'm going to show you a couple of slides. What we've done here is we've taken the, the 20 largest publishers, and we've looked at how many articles they've published in the last three years. Okay, so these are recent articles. So behind paywalls, there were around 4 million articles published in the last three years, whereas around, there were around 600,000 open access articles published. And then we looked at their citation rates. Citation rates basically mean how much science is built on top of an article. And you can see that um, <coughs> open access articles, on average, get more citations than subscription articles. So these are the latest articles, OK? And here we've taken just this graph and expanded it across these 20 largest publishers that are out there today. And what you can see is that you can see this advantage in the open access articles over and over again. So in the last three years, for example, the American Physical Society has uh, gotten a higher citation rate on their open access articles than on their subscription articles. The same is the case for the Oxford University Press, higher citations on their open access than subscription, nearly double the citation rate on Springer Nature's um, journals on open access articles. Here's Frontiers at the same rate as Springer Nature. And over there you find Elsevier. Their subscription articles are still getting more citations than their open access articles, but about uh, a little bit less than plus open access articles and certainly less than both Frontiers and Springer Nature's open access journals. That's within the last three years. Open science, open access, already today has more impact on creating new science than subscription science. Now, if we would just imagine if we were to make it all open, how that would accelerate innovation. And these are the, <coughs> are the views and the download rates from all over the world based on Frontiers articles, 90,000 published so far. And we see that they already got more than 400 million views and downloads really massively from all over the world. And as well from innovation hubs such as Silicon Valley and Shenzhen. And here we zooming in on a particular gene editing article in the Silicon Valley. And you can see, yes, people at Stanford are reading it. But there's as well a lot of people here in Palo Alto and at Google that are reading this particular article. And that is because companies today depend on science and innovation on, and on access to the latest science for their productivity. Today's economy is a knowledge economy. And in this context, to have this rapid and efficient access to the latest science is important for economic growth. And today, <clears throat> it is even more important to have, this to have this access to the latest science because the digital revolution has brought us to a completely new level. And I'll elaborate a little bit on this. Computers today are hyper-abundant, and what's more, they are actually connected to each other. Nearly every household in, uh, in the West has access to the Internet. Computers are as well becoming more powerful, they have more memory, they're becoming faster, while at the same time, the prices are actually shrinking. 
And that's the reason why you find computers today not just in your PC, or computer chips, not just in your PC, but really in all kinds of devices, from phones to drones to even your washing machines nowadays. And that, in turn, has led to an explosion of data production. So what we see here is the data exchange on the Internet, and you can see its exponential growth. More powerful computers, more data, have in turn led uh, to the rise of artificial intelligence. Now, these are algorithms that start making sense out of the data, and um, in fact become more and more clever the more data becomes available. And in the last five years, what we have seen is the rise of amazing artificial intelligence products. No, I'm fine. Yeah. Oh, you can give me some water. I'm getting... It was too loud yesterday, so... Henry thinks I'm getting hoarse. Okay. <clears throat> so, AI, for example, has given us autonomous uh, cars, cars that uh, can completely drive by themselves. Artificial intelligence now as well talks to you and can even plan your day. And artificial intelligence can as well now start beating us at computer games. But let's imagine if we could actually use open science in combination with artificial intelligence and the latest cutting-edge technology to accelerate our scientific process. And we'll hear some of the presentations today that are actually already doing that. But in order to do that, we actually really now need this access to our latest articles and to our latest data as well. And that's not just so trivial. In Frontiers, for example, our, our articles are not just free for humans to read. They're as well free for machines to read. And in fact, we annotate the articles in a way that it's very easy for machines to mine them and extract meaning out of them. And then what we as well need is, this video is not playing, but it doesn't matter. Um, what we as well need is access to our latest data. All of you who sit in this room, you know that we are, in your labs you're producing data in abundance. But what we're not doing is, pu is putting this data systematically into databases and then sharing it with others. But the benefits of sharing data are actually huge, they're enormous. If you take the Human Genome Project, for example, at first people as well tried to patent genes, lock them away behind paywalls, just as we are so well accustomed to do with our articles. But then it was all made open, and the benefits were huge. It allowed geneticists to create the first gene editing therapies for cancer. And for every dollar that was invested in the Human Genome Project, 145 were made in return pretty much triggered the entire biotech industry, which is today worth billions of dollars every year. And open, uh, the open science is today being led by Europe. And we have as well amongst us the visionary and the pioneer behind the open science cloud, that's Jean-Claude Bürgelmann, we're very happy that he's speaking today, about the European Open Science Cloud, which is an initiative to bring together all of Europe's data onto common platforms and allow people then to access it and to share it. But we can as well use all of this now. Open science, cutting-edge technology, artificial intelligence to help us as well address the major challenges that we face as humanity today. The UN has um, formulated 17 sustainable development goals, and I think they can be more or less summarized in four challenges that we are facing today. So what are these challenges? Well, the first one is the one that we've already alluded to at the, quite, quite a lot at the beginning. We want to live healthy lives, and we want to eradicate disease, right? 10,000 diseases today already have cures, but 20,000 still do not have cures. So let's see what some of our speakers actually intend to do about this. We have Marlene Temmerman today, and she is going to talk about how to bring health services to some of the most vulnerable on our planet, uh, women and children in Africa. 
We have Thomas Hatung, who's going to be talking today, and he has built the world's largest toxicological database that is machine-readable, and his AI algorithms can actually already predict the toxicity of drugs, drugs, in some cases even better than animal experimentation. We have Henry. He's bringing together the world's neuroscience uh, data in brain models and brain simulations, and he's going to talk to us how we can use these brain simulations to understand brain diseases better and as well find new cures for them. We have Idan. He's going to talk about what makes us human and how we can use artificial intelligence or whether artificial intelligence is going to bring us to a new level of superhumanity. We have Tony amongst us as well. <clears throat> He's going to be talking about aging. At the beginning, we saw already today, uh, well, in the last 200 years, we've extended our lifespan from 30 years on average to over 80 years. Um, and Tony studies aging, and he has found ways of how blood from young mice given to old mice can make them young again. And then we have as well Paolo Vinayes amongst us. He's using the multi-genomics uh, approach to study the effects of air pollution and climate change on our health. And he's actually going to ask one of the most crucial questions, I believe, of this century. Can we actually live healthy lives without a healthy planet? And this is the second challenge. We got to feed all the people on this planet. <clears throat> Today, we are 7.6 billion people, and the United Nations estimates that within 50 to 70 years, we're going to stabilize, not keep on growing, but really consolidate and stabilize at 11 billion people. So now we need more than ever science and technology to feed these extra four, and all of us, in fact. So how are we going to do that? Well, previous scientific advances have given us pesticides and fertilizers. That's not a bad thing. It saved all of us, and that's why we're in this room today. But now we need science and technology to produce more using less land and using less of those. Artificial intelligence, for example, already today can scan fields, images of fields, and predict pests um, on crops, thus minimizing the use of pesticides. And more than ever as well, we continue to need plant scientists and genetic engineers to develop these high-yield um, crops to feed people using less land, less fertilizers. And then there's meat. We all love meat. We had some yesterday. We're going to have some more. I'm a little bit <laughs> quirky about that. But here, here it comes. We all love meat, but eating meat is actually... a um, problematic for many reasons. We gotta, to feed the cattle takes up a lot of land, to, to have the cattle takes up a lot of land, but as well cows are methane emitting, it's one of the biggest drivers of climate change. Not to talk about all the animal suffering that is involved in all of that. So Mark Post has actually pioneered a way of how to grow meat from um, cultured cells in the lab. And in fact, when he started that, the cost of a lab-grown burger was $300,000 about five or six years ago. Today, it's only $11. So bringing this to the supermarkets could form a completely new basis of our meat consumption conscience, with a good conscience as well. And this is the third challenge, um, and that is to provide energy for all people on this planet. Currently, there is about 10% of the people that consume 50% of the world's energy. But tomorrow, there will be many more people wanting to use much more energy, because as countries move out of poverty into prosperity, people do want to have this meat on the table, they want to have light, they want to have fridges, and ultimately, they want to have the latest toys and gadgets. So we've got to find new ways um, to give people energy. Of course, we want to move to clean energy, and again, solar wind has become uh, already cheaper than fossil fuels, laying the foundation for mass adoption. But we can as well see ways of how artificial intelligence could, for example, help us to regulate our com uh, energy consumption more efficiently. 
It's already helped Google, for example, to reduce the amount of energy necessary for cooling its data centers by 40%. And what it can do for Google, we could imagine that it could do as well for buildings, cities, and even entire countries, as more sensors are being connected to the Internet of Things. So it could help us to regulate our power supplies. So maybe we don't need that much more energy, but we can use it much more efficiently. And this, I think, is the most important uh, challenge of them all. Because what we need to do now is achieve all the other challenges within the boundaries of a healthy planet. There's a downside to the tremendous improvements in our health and our prosperity. Because as we live longer, healthier, we've as well polluted our air. This one is not playing. Can you make it play? But it doesn't really matter. We have polluted our air, we have polluted our oceans, um, we have caused this well, we are we're destroying our forests, we have caused the sixth mass extinction, species are dying away at quite a fast rate, and we ha may have as well brought our climate actually to a tipping point from which there might be maybe no return. So we, what we got to see in the next 50 years is a complete switch to clean energy and sustainable food production so that our children and maybe some other species as well can enter a 22nd uh, century in a good state. Throwing in the towel is not an option. We're scientists and we come up with answers. So Martin Seeger today will explain to us what challenges climate change actually poses and what we can do to limit its magnitude. Scientists provide the solutions, governments regulate and support, and ultimately it's up to businesses to implement these solutions, and Martin will talk about that. We have Sam Cushman amongst us, and he's pioneered uh, the field of uh, landscape genomics, and he'll explain to us how we can use it to manage natural resources better and save forests with it as well. And we have Maria Pilar amongst us as well, and she'll explain uh, to us how waste can actually be turned into a useful resource in a circular economy. Nancy Knowlton has started the Ocean Optimism Movement, and she'll show what amazing advances have already been done in order to conserve marine life. We have Hauke. He studies how we learn and how we make decisions and how we can hopefully move as a society to fact-based decision-making. And then there's Olinga. I'm a little bit out of my depth here, but Olinga is using amazing blockchain technology for social good and how it can be used for spreading love, happiness and hope. And there's also always a plan B. So Carolyn Porker is the visual brain behind um, NASA's uh, Cassini mission, and she's going to take us onto a spectacular tour and through, through the Saturn system and explore the possibility whether humans have a future in outer space. We need open science now. <clears throat> I think what, what should have come across is that it's not all doom and gloom, but we're also not just happy clappers. Science has in reality really uh, saved our lives and that of our children many times over. But we need science now as well to protect our environment and to move us to this clean energy. Everything that was achieved today has been achieved despite severely restricted access to our science. In the future, all science will be open, it will be machine-readable, and it will be AI-ready. And that's the mission that we have as well at Frontiers. And that's when we're going to see an innovation at a rate that we've never seen before. It will continue to drive our economies, and it will give us all the solutions, as it's always done, for a sustainable future. And this future is bright, because there have never been more scientists on this planet than today. We've never had more resources, we've never made more discoveries than today. We are really in a better position to solve any type of problem 
than ever before in human history. And science will give us clean energy, sustainable cities, sustainable food production. It will make us live longer and healthier, all while we can grow our economies at the same time. So I believe we can have it all. But we've got to push through now, all of us as well in this room, to make our science open. A great, this is a great dream, and it can only be realized by a great team. And that's all of us sitting in this room and beyond of this room. And this is actually a quote that I got from Jean-Claude last, uh, last year. He had it on his slides. If you have them again on your slides, sorry, Jean-Claude, to uh, already do it now. But I thought it was really, really beautiful. If you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. I think we're dreamers, but we, we have a plan. We're not alone. We're in this together. And I think we can do it together as well. Make science open. Thank you.